Doing well? Enjoying your time here at Club DPT? Is anyone not enjoying their time here at Club DPT? I, you know, I, I feel sometimes like this is like one of those bad travel brochures where you look online and it's like, oh my God, look at the ocean. And then you get there and realize it's all airbrushed, right? Like they've taken all the blues and the greens and dragged it so that you don't see all the seaweed. I'm kidding. It's not that bad. It's not that bad. <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe it is. All right, so let's go ahead and get rolling here. So remember, remember, we have a lab exam one week from today. This is where you guys say yay. Uh, that was awful. All right, so lab exam one week from today. What we're going to cover today is we're going to cover more gluteal muscles. We're going to cover a whole bunch of muscles today. We're going to cover basically the entire hip. And what I will say about the slides is that you're going to see some slides that are coming from the hip show, if you will, on Canvas and the thigh show on Canvas. We will revisit all those muscles when we hit the thigh. I feel like the discussion I was just having before class, there's going to be a lot of overlap. And there's going to be a lot of blurred lines between what is a thigh muscle, what is a knee muscle, what is a hip muscle. For example, your quadriceps, hip flexor, and knee extender. So as an anatomist, you got to figure, okay, well, what, where do I cover it? Well, I kind of take the shotgun approach, and well, we're just going to do both. So understand that if you don't see a slide on your hip slideshow, it's probably in the thigh, and that's okay. We're going to draw it out, but realize we're going to revisit it as well. So the first concept that I wanted to cover, and we're going to cover this very, very briefly, because I, I want you to understand how the formation of a lot of these patterns are going to come in. And what I will say, when it comes to the hip, you're going to see a lot of patterns, a ton of patterns. The quicker you can recognize the patterns, the easier the hip is going to be. Because as you guys have seen from your reading and the homework and cadaver dissection, there is a whole bunch of muscle there, right? In fact, I mean, the hip is probably one of our densest attachments for muscles in the human body. So one of the things I wanted to cover was the obturator canal, what the obturator canal really is. So if we take a look at, and basically what we're going to draw in here is the pubic ramus in the obturator foramen. Okay, so this being my superior pubic ramus. Obviously, down here is my inferior pubic ramus. And this area here that I'm darkening in, that'll be my pubic symphysis. So what we've already learned about the obturator foramen is that we have kind of this large obturator fascia. And the obturator fascia is really important because it's going to go right in the middle of that obturator foramen. The other thing that we're going to notice here is that we're going to have two muscles, and we're going to get into these guys just a little bit later, that are going to be named exclusively for their reference point relative to the obturator foramen. Okay, that's obturator internus and obturator externus. And this is going to be really important to remember because when we get into the six deep lateral rotators, aka the P go go cues that we talked about last week, we will not be able to see all six deep lateral rotators. And in fact, we're only going to be able to see five of them. But the one that you would expect you're not going to see is not the one that you're actually not going to see because you're going to see obturator internus, but you're not going to see obturator externus. And that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? It seems like if I'm looking at the posterior aspect of the hip and looking at those deep lateral rotators, I should be able to see obturator externus, and I can't. In fact, it's going to be buried. It's going to be deep 
to all those deep lateral rotators. I will be able to see operator interns. Just understand and realize that the nomenclature is based on those muscles and how they insert onto the obturator foramen. So I'm going to have two different muscles here, right? So I'm going to have two different muscles. I'm going to have in green, we're going to kind of write in in green. Obturator externus because it's on the external portion of the obturator foramen. The other muscle I'm going to have here, and I'm going to draw it in in the same striation line because what we're going to learn is they're going to do basically the same thing. And that muscle in purple is going to be obturator internus. It's going to be on the inside or the internal aspect of the obturator foramen. So literally those muscles almost kind of come together like my hands are coming together in front of my body. They're named based on their relative position to the obturator foramen. Now as you see, I've drawn in a gap here. And this gap is going to be called the obturator canal. And this obturator canal is going to be really important because what it's going to do is going to provide a pathway or a passageway for my obturator named vessels and nerves to get down to their final destination. And this is where the patterning comes in. So I bet I could ask you guys, what artery and what nerve do you think go through the obturator canal? Obturator artery, obturator nerve. Says what it does, does what it says, right? Easy as pie. That's how easy this stuff is if you recognize the patterns. So my contents of my obturator canal are going to be my obturator artery. and my obturator nerve. Now what we're going to see is that my obturator artery and my obturator nerve are going to supply the medial compartment of my thigh. And this is where a lot of the patterns are going to come in. We're going to see a very similar pattern and a very similar distribution that we saw in the arm way back last semester. If you guys remember, each of those compartments of the arm was innervated by a different nerve, wasn't it? Cutaneous nerve, radial nerve, all those guys. We're going to see the same pattern. So what we're going to see is that my obturator nerve is going to innervate the muscles in the medial compartment. Now, press pause for a second. The hip is a little weak in the fact that every concept in the hip has an exception. Oh boy, right? Oh, great. So what we're gonna see, and this is where, when you look at the Grace book, you're gonna see a lot of charts, right? You guys seen those muscle charts in there and stuff. We're gonna see a muscle called pectineus. Pectineus technically is lumped in with the meat department because it has a very large a deduction action. But because pectineus likes to be weird, and that's what we're going to find is that we're always something weird. It's not innervated by the obturator nerve, it's innervated by the femoral nerve. So just be very, very careful in knowing what exceptions, we're gonna see several of these exceptions throughout the entire unit here, okay? Any questions about obturator canal? Like I said, pretty darn easy. All right, here we go. Muscles, we like muscles. 
So when it comes to my hip flexors, I'm going to have several major hip flexors here. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw the lower end of the lumbar spine. Okay, so let's call this L4. Let's call this L5. We're going to draw this big triangle looking bone here. Maybe I want to gander what I guess that is. Right, that's my big sacrum. We're going to put S for sacrum. And then we're going to draw out. I'm going to draw this on one side because obviously the right side of the page here doesn't have a ton of room. Draw out a huge iliac crest. Nice big obturator foramen, which we just went over. And then drawing out, as you guys know, I can't draw a femur to save my life, so I'm going to attempt again. Not any better than the rest of them. In fact, that was so bad, I'm going to retry it. In fact, let's do this. Improved? Very much so. Thank you. So what I need to understand is that I'm going to have several hip flexors here. This is a big reason why when we perform hip flexion in the manual muscle test, we get a big, strong contraction. Not only do I have a lot of muscles that are performing that action, but they're pretty darn beefy, right? We don't have like little wimpy rhomboid minor doing any of this garbage, right? We got some pretty big muscles happening here. So we've already covered a couple of these, but I'm just going to draw them in just for completion's sake. We have psoas major, right? Remember psoas major, it's going to come down off basically the anterior portion of the transverse processes of T12 to L5, right? And psoas major gets lonely. So it picks up its buddy iliacus, which comes off the iliac fossa. And they form the supergroup iliopsoas. Which then attaches down to the greater, I'm sorry, attaches down to the lesser trochanter. Okay, so here we have so as major and iliacus forming together iliopsoas. The big thing to understand and we kind of went over this already. So as major and iliacus are going to have different but overlapping nerve supplies. Okay, so iliacus, L2, L3, right? So as major, L1, L2. So just understand that those muscles have different nerve supplies. Why do I need to know this? Because if I have an L1 disc protrusion that's only affecting L1, I may see weak hip flexion. Why? Because I have several other muscles that are able to do the action. The next big one that I'm going to see here is going to be pectineus. And pectineus is going to come off of the pectineal line of the pubis bone, and it's going to come in and it's going to attach into essentially the greater trochanter, as, I'm sorry, the lesser trochanter as well. So this guy's pectineus. I'm going to star this one about four different times. Why? Because like I just mentioned, pectineus traditionally is going to be grouped with our medial compartment or our AD ductors. And what I want you guys to understand is how the muscle fiber striation, aka the morphology of the muscle, is going to dictate that. Pectineus is going to AD duct. It will AD duct. But 
because, and the, the, the 2D representation doesn't do this justice, the pectineus muscle is going to live anterior or ventral to the axis of rotation, right, or the center of the axis of rotation of the femur. So based on that, right, so if I have a pectineus muscle that's sitting anterior and it has some fibers that will travel in the sagittal plane, when I contract it, yes, it will adduct, but it's also going to flex. Because remember, when I'm contracting a muscle, remember what the word contraction means. I'm shortening. I'm bringing my insertion closer to my origin. So if that muscle sits in that anterior compartment, regardless of the fact that it has most of the fibers oriented in the trans, I'm sorry, in the frontal plane, it's going to have a little bit of a flexion. Okay, so again, think about test questions, right? Had a patient, they had their quadriceps radically surgically removed, right, in a freak accident. Are they still able to flex their hip? Which of the following muscles would allow them to flex their hip? Pectineus. Okay, All right, so start thinking about this information in that fashion, but understand how it's made. That's going to attach in the lesser trochanter as well. I think Grace has a more detailed explanation of it. Yeah, it's like the anterior surface of the lesser trochanter between, you know, two different astrological signs or something. <laughs> I mean, come on, don't, don't tell me you guys don't think about that sometimes. We look at that when you look at Grace's textbook, and it's like, you know, it's like, hey, eh? <laughs> by show of hands, who's looking at those Grace muscle charts going, hey? Eh? <laughs> Fair enough. All right, a couple more that we're going to cover here. So the next big one is going to be a muscle that's going to sound like something you order at Starbucks, right? This is the tensor fascia lata, or as I like to call it, tensor fascia latte. So essentially, TFL, and that's going to be the shortened term for tensor fascia latte or lata, is going to come off of the lateral as aspect of the iliac crest between the ASIS and the tubercular crest. So what does that mean? Near the ASIS, basically, okay? So this guy here is TFL, tensor fascia latte, TFL. Now this guy is gonna get starred and hashtagged and smiley face emoji too. Because what we're gonna see, this is gonna be another exception is that my TFL, according to the GRACE textbook, is not going to have a whole bunch of focus or a whole bunch of action at the hip. Now, what I will tell you is, if I fire that thing up with an EMG, and I hit one of you guys with the probe and your TFL, what will happen is your hip will flex. Why? Because that muscle crosses the hip. According to GRACE, what the TFL does is it does exactly what it says it does, right? This is a great example. It says what it does, does what it says. What does my tensor fascia lata do? It tenses my fascia lata. What is the layman's term for fascia lata? IT band, right? What does IT band stand for? Iliotibial band. So if you look at Gray's, what it says TFL does is it stabilizes an extended knee. And what we're going to learn is that TFL is going to play a huge component in the lateral stabilization of the knee. Because what we're going to find here when we start covering the knee is that I'm only going to have a couple really small ligaments, medial collateral ligament and lateral collateral ligament, that are going to provide frontal plane or medial lateral stability of that knee. So I need a little bit of extra help. TFL, by way of the IT band, is going to provide that on the lateral side. And then we're going to cover a whole different concept on the medial side called the peasant serine, or literally what means goose's foot, which is a combination of three different muscles that are going to provide extra stability to the medial side of the knee. Like a little teaser, right? So a little two minute thing after a marble moving the credits. Which is, I mean, honestly kind of gotten like an encore at a concert, like you just expect it. So. I digress. 
I have two more big hip flexors here. The next big hip flexor I'm going to see is I'm going to see something called the sartorius muscle. Sartorius, right? Sartorius muscle is going to come off of the anterior superior iliac spine. It's going to be one of those three muscles that's going to combine at the medial knee, because if you look at Gray's, it actually inserts into the medial tibia. All right, so now we're getting really far down the bottom. So sartorius is this big, long strap muscle that goes from the ASIS down to the medial tibia, innervated by the femoral nerve, and it flexes the hip, a B ducts the hip, and this one's not engraved, but it also externally rotates the hip. This is why sartorius is called the tailor's muscle. That's actually what sartorius means, is tailor's muscle, mm -hmm. because a lot of the tailors used to sit, quote, cross-legged when they sew. I don't name the, name the stuff, okay? So I personally call it the hacky sack muscle, because that's the muscle you're going to exercise when you play hacky sack. The other big hip flexor we're going to see is we're going to see one of our four quadriceps muscles. This muscle is going to come off of the AIIS, and it's going to be the long, straight muscle of the femoral region or the thigh. This guy is going to be called rectus femoris. Also going to put a couple asterisks next to this one as well. Why? Because as physical therapists, we're going to need to understand, yes, my quadriceps have a major effect at my knee. In fact, they are the big heavy hitter for knee extension. But because rectus femoris crosses the hip joint, it also has an effect at the hip. And next year, when you guys get into orthopedics and MSK, what you're going to find out is that there's a special test called the Thomas test, where you're going to be able to look at, is this iliopsoas or is this rectus femoris? Okay. Are you guys familiar with that one yet? Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Good. So you guys will dive deeper into that one next year. But understanding is that tightness coming from rectus femoris or understanding is that tightness coming from the iliopsoas is a huge piece of information to have. But you have to understand where these attachments happen in order to really understand what that test is all about. Okay? Yeah? Um, what did you say external rotation of the hip. Yeah, so flexion, abduction, external rotation. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions about hip flexors? It's a lot. It's a lot. That's just one part of it. We even covered the other two sections of the hip. Yay! All right. So next thing we're going to cover is we're going to cover the posterior aspect. Everybody go with this picture? Anybody not good with this picture? Sweet. All right. Hip extensors. Now we're getting into the backside, the caboose. Okay. What we're going to see is that we're going to have two major areas of muscle for hip extension. We're going to have a superficial section. And we're going to have a deep section. Okay. The superficial section is going to have one very large muscle. It literally is named based on where it is in its relation to the other muscles. It is called gluteus maximus. Now, the interesting things about gluteus maximus 
are it attaches, as you've seen from Graves, to a whole bunch of stuff, right? We got ileal attachments, we got sacral attachments, we got sacral tuberous ligament attachments. That's just the origin, a little bit of the issue tuberosity, right? It's all over the place. It is a big, broad, massive muscle. And then it inserts into a whole bunch of stuff too, right? Kind of this gluteal line on the femur, a little bit of the IT band, like it does all this stuff. Gluteus maximus is going to be one of my major forceful hip extensors. It's going to be innervated by inferior gluteal nerve. And remember, we talked about gluteus medius, gluteus minimus last week, or the Monday or whenever that was. And we said gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, innervated by superior gluteal nerve. And what that superior actually means, right? It's superior relative to its exit through the pelvis based on its position with piriformis. Gluteus maximus, bless you, inferior gluteal nerve. Okay? That's going to be the superficial section. For the deep section, I'm going to see a whole bunch of stuff. Get ready. Okay, we ready? Okay. Semimembranosis. Semitendinosis. And biceps femoris. Now, collectively, we know those in layman's terms as the hamstrings. Understand that my hamstrings not only flex my knee, they extend my hip too. And this gets really important in terms of movement analysis, especially things like the gait cycle. Because think about when I'm walking and I'm performing the swing phase of gait. What position is my hip in? My hip's in flexion. What position is my knee in? My knee's in extension. Are my hamstrings being stretched here? For me, yeah, because I'm super tight and super duper tight. Right? For the kicker on my high school football team, not even close. So understand hip extension, knee flexion. Okay, we're obviously going to cover the hip extension now. When we get down to the knee, we'll start covering the knee flexion. Those are going to be those other three big hip extensors. Now, the other thing I need to start worrying about here is external rotation. And this is where life gets a little more difficult. So this program has coined the term the P go go cues. These are the six deep lateral rotators or six deep external rotators. Now, the fun thing about these muscles is you should know the actions of all these muscles, right? So on a lab exam, those are easy points. That's putting the ball on the tee for you. All these muscles will perform external rotation. What we're going to draw in is we're going to draw kind of an exaggerated sacrum. Actually, it's probably a life-size sacrum. And the first thing we're going to draw in is not going to be a muscle, but it's going to be the superior gluteal artery and nerve. Because we can't forget about that. And the reason we're going to do that is because the next thing we're going to draw in is going to be the piriformis muscle. P 
piriformis is going to originate off of the anterior surface of the sacrum. And that's really important to remember because we have to understand that even though the piriformis is not considered a pelvic diaphragm muscle or a pelvic floor muscle, it's still coming from the inside of the pelvis, like we drew in a couple weeks ago. It's going to insert into the greater trochanter of the femur. Now, believe it or not, I was just having a discussion with Dr. Shulkin about this, about how to stretch the piriformis, right? Because it is a huge debatable topic. The piriformis attaches into the greater trochanter. If you look at Gray's, if my hip is at neutral, the piriformis will perform external rotation. Cool, we're cool with that. However, if I flex my hip up to 90 degrees, my piriformis no longer performs external rotation. It performs abduction. Okay, now the reason for that, if we think about it, is my greater trochanter, where that muscle attaches or inserts, it's right up here at the top. You guys can see it up here, right up here at the top, right? Now, what happens when I flex my hip to 90 degrees? Where does my greater trochanter go? It rolls or rocks to the posterior aspect. So that piriformis muscle is no longer up here in the superior chamber, the superior aspect. It's now attaching and traveling more in the transverse plane. So be aware of that because that piriformis muscle, depending on the reference frame, to use that biomechanics term, or depending on where it is or where it starts, is going to have a different action. Piriformis, if you look at Gray's, comes from the S1, S2 innervation. There's a lot of textbooks that literally say it is innervated by the nerve to piriformis, in which I always say, if you get that one wrong, oh boy, right? Nerve to piriformis goes to piriformis. Please don't say the ner nerve to piriformis goes to like the quad. <laughs> now, here's going to be the problem. There's going to be a couple in here that are actually going to go, and we're going to have some twinsies, if, if you will. So the other thing I'm going to draw in here next is going to be our next little buddy, which is an inferior gluteal artery and nerve. So the P is going to be for piriformis. Okay, so P equals piriformis. In Latin, piriformis literally means pear-shaped. The original anatomist looked at piriformis and went, hey, Chuck, that looks like a pear, doesn't it? And they're like, yeah, let's call it pear. Awesome. Like I said, I don't name this stuff. The next big muscle that we're going to encounter here is going to be the first G. And this muscle is going to have a twin. In fact, it's going to be named twin. This is called Jumellus superior. It says what it is, is what it says. It is the superior of the twin muscles. Now, this is where life gets just a little crazy, okay? Again, don't shoot the messenger on this one. The innervation of Jumella superior, and like I said, innervation of piriformis is nerve to piriformis. Awesome, gotcha. Guess what the innervation to Jumella superior is? The nerve to obturator internus. Yep, see? Whoa, what, what, what? Obturator internus. What's that? That's I agree. I agree. 
in, in fact, you know, if, if I think we ever did like a redo of the human body, I'd probably change that. Is, I mean, come on. I mean, it's it's like rewiring a house, right? You just kind of flipping around and no big deal. Now the next muscle that we're going to see is going to be our first. Pick a different color here. I already use that green. This is going to be our first O. Remember, we're going to see this O, and that's going to be obturator internus. Now, luckily, take a sigh of relief. Guess what the innervation to obturator internus is? Now, nerve to obturator internus. The next muscle I'm going to encounter here is going to be gemellus inferior. Now, the innervation of the nerve to, I'm sorry, the innervation to Jamal's inferior is the nerve to, ready? Quadratus femoris. Don't worry, there's only one more of these. I'm sorry, there's two more. I'm not going to draw in obturator externus. OK, so we're going to kind of put obturator externus up here. Because remember, you can't see obturator externus. Remember, you can see obturator internus from the posterior, but you can't see obturator externus. So we're going to leave that guy alone for a minute. The other one I'm going to see back here is going to be this square muscle of the thigh which is literally going to be called quadratus femoris luckily its innervation is the nerve to quadratus femoris my suggestion is just take a look at the patterns, right? Now, getting back to obturator externus, what we're going to see is obturator externus actually gets its innervation from the obturator nerve. And a little branch off of it. And in fact, that's why if you look over this picture, it's kind of off to the side. So me personally, if I was studying this information, I would look at the patterns. OK, so here's what I got. I got piriformis, nerve to piriformis. Cool. That guy's off on its own. Gemellus superior and obturator internus are linked because they share innervation. Nerve to operator internus. The other pattern here is when I have those linked muscles, the inferior named muscle has the innervation. OK. So if I'm thinking on a test, uh oh, I got Jamel superior and I got obturator internus. I know he said something about the shared innervation. The inferior muscle is going to dominate that innervation. Same thing with gemellus inferior and quadratus femoris. Inferior muscle holds and dominates the innervation. OK, so I understand this stuff gets very, very confusing. and It's a lot of information. Try to recognize some patterns and that should give you some shortcuts. Yeah. By what well, hold and dominate the innervation, what I'm saying is that the innervation for the inferior muscle innervates both muscles. OK, it's, it's not necessarily stealing. It's not. Yeah, all, all I'm saying is that 
No, no, no. It's not stronger. It's not coming off a certain nerve root, nothing like that. I'm just chunking it in my head, saying if I'm looking at those two, the in, it's gonna be, the nerve is going to be named on the inferior muscle of the of the twins. Okay, does that make sense? So that's all I meant by dominant. All right. How are we doing? <laughs> that looks set at all, guys. All right. So next group of muscles, we're going to cover one more group. One more group. We're going to cover one more group, and then we're all done. Okay. We're going to cover the hip adductors. Now, what we're going to see with these hip adductors is again i'm going to have a lot of shared innovation i'm going to have a lot of patterning i'm going to have a couple weirdo exceptions that's just how the hip works the weirdo exceptions what we're going to find out are actually very beneficial because we're going to get into a muscle called adductor magnus and what we're going to see and you guys will see this in lab is that adductor magnus almost engulfs the entire medial and posterior aspect of the thigh of the femur, right? Like it literally almost like wraps all the way around. So it's going to get based on what section of adductor magnus you're looking at, it's going to get a different innervation as well. All right. So if we take a look at again, here's You guys got to admit, out of all the bones that I've drawn on the body, my sacrum is the best. Here's a femur that kind of looks like either the state of Michigan or a mitten. So my AD doctors, most of them are going to be innervated by the obturator nerve. Okay, obturator nerve essentially is going to come off L234. That's going to get the majority of my hip AD doctors. The first big one that we're going to encounter is going to be a muscle that comes off the ischial ramus, inferior pubic ramus, and it goes all the way down to the tibia. Right? And this is going to be the third muscle. We didn't cover the second one. But one of those three muscles that's going to attach into the tibia and become that pes answer line or that goose's foot. And what this guy is called is this guy is called gracilis. Gracilis is going to be an obturator nerve muscle. No big deal. What we're going to see, and this is where life gets a little complicated. It is going to adduct the thigh. But because gracilis also comes off of the anterior aspect of the pubis bone it's also going to be a little bit in that anterior compartment which means it's also going to have a small hip flexion action as well so big number one heavy hitter adduction of the hip but gracilis is also going to flex the hip as well Obturator nerve. Yep. Oh, you're fine. No big deal. The next one we already kind of covered, and I said to cover it again. This is going to be that pectineus muscle. Now remember, pectineus is essentially, I'm going to kind of start here. Pectineus is a hip adductor also a hip flexor based on its origin and insertion in the anterior compartment remember pectineus 
is going to have innervation from the femoral nerve, not the obturator nerve. Pectineus is also going to serve as one of the two muscles that are going to form the floor of the femoral triangle. And what we're going to learn, and this will probably be on Monday, is that femoral triangle is extremely important, especially for dry needling, because we have the femoral artery that goes right through it. Safety tip, don't slice open the femoral artery. Call it a tip. So pectineus is going to be one of my other hip adductors, but also hip flexor. Our next big one is going to be a muscle called adductor longus. Adductor longus, I'm going to draw it on the other side of gracilis here. Again, it's going to come off of kind of the external body of the pubis bone. This is going to be an obturator. So I'll write femoral up here for you guys. This is going to be an obturator nerve muscle. What we're going to see with adductor longus is it is going to adduct, but as an added bonus, it's also going to perform medial or internal rotation. The next big heavy hitter we're going to see here is going to be adductor magnus. Adductor magnus says what it is, is what it says. It is the magnetic, mag, maximum, huge, monstrous muscle of the medial compartment. And in fact, what you're going to see is you're going to see a ton of very transverse plane oriented fibers with adductor magnus. Now, adductor magnus, as an aside, is going to have two different portions, and this is important. Adductor magnus is going to have an ischial portion, or kind of like a posterior portion, and a medial portion. What we're going to see is that that medial portion is going to get obturator nerve innervation. This posterior portion is actually going to get sciatic nerve innervation. Adductor magnus is going to adduct and internally rotate. One more to go, I promise. So if we have an adductor longus and we have an adductor magnus, what we have to understand is what are those muscles named based off of? They're named based off of the relative size versus the other muscles. The last one we have here is going to be adductor brevis. So this adductor brevis is going to come off of Inferior pubic ramus, essentially. I know Grace has a couple other attachments as well. Attaches in to the posterior surface of the proximal femur. This is adductor brevis. This is going to be another obturator nerve muscle, so obturator nerve is going to innervate it, and it's going to adduct, and it's going to medially or internally rotate my hip. Yeah. They really don't lay that superficially to deep. They all kind of lay 
I get in a big line. Why? Because my pictures that bad. I, I understand. Yeah, they, they all. If you look at, if we if we dissect it down that deep, you basically see them all kind of fan off of a various area of the pubic radius, and then they're all going to go to their respective locations on the finger. So, like I said, understand the patterns, understand the hip is kind of weird. Yes? Uh, do you think that's the longest amount of pieces, or does it run behind? It runs behind, yeah. So, yeah, it's not two pieces. <clears throat> so, like I said, big things are recognize the patterns here. You have a very, very good, you have a gambler's chance if you know what compartment of the thigh you're in. If I'm in the medial compartment, I'm going to call it obturator nerve. If I'm in the anterior compartment, I'm going to say femoral nerve. If I'm in the posterior compartment, I'm going to say sciatic nerve, most commonly tibial portion of a sciatic nerve. That's your gambler's chance understand that there are exceptions to all of this like i said muscles like tfl get innervation off of superior gluteal artery muscles like pectineus get innervation off of femoral nerve adductor magnus gets a couple different sources there's always a couple exceptions here okay all right any questions that was a lot that was every hip muscle we have in an hour All right. Yeah. It does. It's very. They all kind of have transversely oriented fibers, or front, well, mostly frontal plane oriented fibers. But adductor magnus has some. It literally they just go in a very horizontal direction. Thank you. You're good.